You know, doing power management on today's small form factor designs is kind of a nightmare. I mean, we've got one battery, and it's tiny, so we're not actually allowed to use any of it. <laughs> And no matter what the voltage of that battery is, we have to provide nice, stable power at a bunch of different voltages. Let's see, I need 5 volts and 1.2 volts and 2.05 volts. Don't want to forget that 0.05 there, right? <laughs> and how about a little 1.85 volts thrown in for good measure? And we need to charge and monitor that sacred battery, of course, there's another requirement. Oh, and our solution can't take up any space. So, that's great. We'll just find a way to cram something way over here at the edge of the board in how many millimeters? Phew, that's all, right? No, it isn't, actually. It needs to cost almost nothing because we're watching our bomb like a hawk. Oh, and there also needs to be basically no noise in this sucker because we have some pretty picky functions like audio amplifiers. And when do you need this design done? Tomorrow afternoon. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Clearly, I need some help in power design. And apparently, I'm in luck because my guests today are Karthi Gopalan, Carrie Delano, and Garaf Metal from Maxim Integrated. And we're going to be discussing Maxim's Simo Pemix. Is that how you pronounce these? Regardless, I'm excited because I'm told they're going to help me solve my power management woes. <laughs> All right, let's get started. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about Maxim Integrated's Simo Power Management ICs. Hi, Karthi. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Okay, so we are talking about how we can power the future today with always aware SIMO power management ICs. But Karthi, before we get into the nuts and bolts here, what do these kind of PMICs buy me as an engineer? And what kind of markets are you seeing them make a big splash in these days? So let me start with the later portion of your question. You use the right adjective splash. So today in 2019 and by 2020, we will have close to 20 billion IoT devices connected to the edge. Of that, personal consumer devices, you know, the low power kind of devices are one of the major drivers when it comes to this big pool of IoT devices out there. So of that, most of these personal devices, right, we carry it on us. So it's either we use it as a ear pod, or like as a hearable, or we strap it across our wrist as a wearable, or we have home automation devices or smart rings. We have baby monitors. We have, you know, smart shoes nowadays, smart wearables, right? So there are a diverse set of end applications out there where you see the consumers are hungry for these devices and they all need to be powered and they all are wireless. So the chosen solution in the last year has been Maxim Simopemic. And let me just say what SIMO stands for. It's single inductor multiple output. And we will go through a deeper dive as to what it means. As such, at the top level, our SIMO PMIX, they address certain industry needs. So these devices, they go into your ear canal. So they have to be super compact. And our solutions are very tiny. They have to be low power because mostly they're powered by single cell lithium ion. And then most companies nowadays, our customer base, they do not stop with creating one product. They have multiple products within one roof. So these products, the PMIX that they use, they end up having to be scalable, right? Across these diverse set of applications I just listed and I just gave you a handful sure. of them out here. So the nuts and bolts of it is Simo PMIX is the smallest solution today in the market. By the way, it's been a year since these products have come out. And right now, we are the smallest. We provide the highest efficiency when it comes to the system. And obviously, you can see that we do have an existing wide fan base. Okay, so Karthi, I see one product here, but you guys have multiple options for me, right? This is scalable, correct? Correct. 
So what I have out here is on the left side, you see there's multiple gadgets out there, right? So I talked to you about the edge and the 20 billion odd devices. So some of the common market needs that we have identified, many of these devices, right? They're single cell, so they need a charger. These devices, right? Basically, they're connected to NFC. Nowadays, payment is turning it to a big thing, right? And then they're connected to sensors, heart rate monitors, biometrics, various different temperature sensor, etc. They're all wireless. So you have, they're connected to a Bluetooth module or audio module, right? And a microprocessor. So these are some of the resources that these PMIX power. While they're powering these resources, they have to be super high efficient. And how do we hit that efficiency? The quiescent current has to be super low and they have to be compact. They have to have wide range of inputs. So in this case, you know, typically it's 2.7 to 5.5 volts. And the output typically ranges from 0.8 to 5.25 volts. So these are some of the commonalities when it comes to serving all those products that you see on the left side. So now, Simo PMIC, I'm using one particular example here, Max 77650. So this particular PMIC, it's highly integrated and it has three rails. And in this example, it's connected to a NFC. It's connected to a microcontroller, an audio codec. And so what this particular platform has is it has regulator inbuilt. It has a charger. It has current sinks basically connected to these indicators. In this case, it's LED. This solution has flexible power sequencing because customer A may have a certain startup power sequencing and customer B may have a different startup sequencing or platform A may have a different need, right? Sure. So what happens is we have the ability to give our customers the sequence of their choice. So we have programmability. Plus, we also have a 150 milliamp LDO for these noise sensitive rails. You see, it's like feature rich and it makes it perfect to be able to address all these diverse devices. And the next question you asked is, hey, yes, I'm highlighting one product out here. How do we have a very scalable portfolio, right? So that leads me to this portfolio that I have up here. As you can see at the top lane, you can think of it as a track. So track number one is the most integrated solution that we have. You know, it's a multi-function PMIC. And I just gave you an overview of the Mac 77650, right? So let me talk to you about the Mac 77278. So there are applications out there that have buttons. So they would need more GPIOs and they would have other needs, right? So what we have done is we've created, we took the first generation product and we have created the next generation that enables multiple IO sources. So that's one that's on the top lane. And in the middle lane, there are applications where a customer may choose to use a discrete charger or they don't need a charger. So then we have options, multiple options, where you get just the Simo buck boost. So again, one inductor across three power rails. So for example, if I can focus on the last product there in that middle lane max 17 to 70, right? This particular product is a nano power solution. You know, it's the most compact solution we have. And it also has resistor programmability so that sometimes customers want to program certain things at their end. So it doesn't have to be factory programmable, that aspect. So we've given that flexibility to our customers. And most of our products are like the packaging is for the consumer market. So it's WLP. However, we also see that, you know, with IoT, you know, things go all over, right? So for companies like smaller companies or industrial market, they prefer leaded package. So this Mac 17 270 also comes in a leaded version. So we have options there too. And the last lane, we have a charger, Mac 7734. This is a very highly robust charger, okay, linear charger. It has LDO incorporated within it. It has ship mode. It's in WLP package. 
And since I did talk to you about how these products touch our skin, right? Be it your wrist or your ears, right? So imagine the thermal shock if you do not have a proper, you know, charger inside that particular piece of uh, device, right? So we also monitor that. And so it is JATA compliant because at the end of the day, as consumers, we always gravitate towards products that one feels good and also has to be safe. Sure. So, so this is round one of what we have today in the market. And you can see that you have so many flavors and options. So Karthi, this really seems like it could be cool for a lot of other applications. Now, where are we headed from here? This IoT train doesn't seem to be slowing down any. Absolutely. So it's like moving at a supersonic speed. So people have already started coming to us with their next generation needs. So we have heard people saying they need real-time language translation on their hearables, the ear pod. Yeah. And it's not one language. Some people say they want up to 26 languages translated real-time. Wow. And so you see artificial intelligence now creeping into these devices, right? Yeah. And then some folks out there want touchless control, wherein You wave your hand over the device, like the hearable, so that you could either go forward, rewind, replay, and such. So that's touchless. Gesture sensing is becoming very common, but not so common in these, you know, personal devices, but that is also in the roadmap. Sure. And then biometric readers. So... Today, you and I are very familiar with fingerprinting, right? Yeah. But then people are looking into iris scanning, you know, like a mission impossible kind of a situation, right? So you have facial recognition. We've started seeing that now that just come in. And then we also have, when it comes to hearable, people have started, you know, bone conduction, by the way, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's been around since Beethoven's era. So uh, Beethoven apparently held his composer's stick. He couldn't hear, right? He had problems, right? Yeah. So he held it between his teeth and touched the keys. Uh huh. And that's how he was able to hear what he played. So bone conduction has been around, but then now more people want to use bone conduction for the hearables. And then it turns into a device for the hearing impaired folks. So it's a good technology out there. So we are seeing that. And resonant wireless charging, and then you need very precise positioning. So all these things being packed into these compact electronics, right? So you can see that that particular hearable has so many different applications. Means greater horsepower, the CPUs are more hungry, they need higher power, right? So that is where all these next-gen features are leading to. And then... We also see smart wearables, we are seeing smart locks, we are seeing some of these features going into our athletic equipment. My tennis racket has a sensor today, Sure. but and during the last World Cup, we saw the goal line technology, but now it's proliferating across multiple platforms, even for the local league and such. So what does this mean for me being in a semiconductor company? So it means our PMIX need to have more loads, They need to have more rails. They need to be able to handle greater power. That's one. So it's power hungry device. Number two, one thing our customers never compromise on. They want all this, but they will not compromise on the efficiency. They want the battery to last for as long as it can. So the longer usage time is going nowhere. So we do not, you know, so that stays. So we have to solve this and our innovation out here continues so we have more cooking in our kitchen <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and so this is where what we see today you know where the industry is heading towards all right god it's time to get down to some serious engineering business so what does the simo power management ic really look like let's get into some architecture details sure here i'm showing you the simplified block diagram for the simo architecture We have one inductor. The SBB0, 1, and 2 are the three programmable regulated rails. And so during operation, when one of the output voltage goes below a specified threshold, 
it tells the internal controller that it needs to be serviced. What that initiates is a charge cycle. So the energy starts building in the inductor and continues until the inductor current hits the I limit. And after that, there is a discharge cycle where the energy is discharged to the output capacitor and delivered to the output, which had raised the flag and was in the queue to be serviced. Now, this will continue for the other rails, which put themselves in the queue. So we follow the FIFO, which is the first in, first out protocol. So the key thing here is that the loads, when they're not symmetrical, say one of the output rail, which is the SBB0, is at 200 milliamps. And the SBB1 is at 5 milliamps, and the SBB2 is at 50 milliamps. So the SBB0 will require much more frequent servicing. And that's what's going to keep raising its flag more frequently than the other. And that is what our controller very seamlessly handles. So whichever output puts itself in the queue, that's the one which gets serviced. Okay. And over here, when none of the rails have to be serviced, it goes into the ideal state. And at that case, you see only one of the FETs are on and the rest of them are off. Ah, okay. So, Gaurav, there's a lot of activity going on in the inductor. Can you explain that a bit more? Yeah, so over here you see that I have three triangles showing you for each of the different outputs, which is the different SBBs, you know, 0, 1, and 2. The ones colored blue, that's the energy built in in the inductor. Oh, okay. So you would notice that the charge cycle or the charging slope is constant for all the three triangles. Whereas the discharge cycle, that is dependent on your output voltage setting. So the one on the left is a higher output voltage as compared to the one on the right side, the extreme right. So you see that the slopes are a little different. The steeper the slope, that is the higher the output voltage, the less amount of current can be delivered to that particular output. And the lower the output voltage, the more amount of current can be delivered to that output. That is what this curve or this plot shows. Now, in these kind of applications, which Karthi had mentioned also about the hearables and variables, the size or the space comes at a very high premium. That is where this PMIC, the SIMO PMIC, really stands out. The plot or the snapshot shown here, we have chosen the most common components which are available. And you see that the whole solution size, including the PMIC, the capacitor and the inductor is only 19.2 millimeter square. That is really, really small. That is small. So, you know, you're getting all this functionality, you're getting all the great performance with such a small footprint. Okay, so because every design is different, what does the performance look like under different conditions? So... This one, what I'm showing here is I'll walk you through a few of the performance characteristics of this PMIC. Okay. Uh, I'll start off with the voltage ripple. So this curve is a busy slide. And so the top, that is the inductor current. I have three output voltages, which is 3.3 volts, 1.2 and the 2.05. Think of this powering one of your hearable device where you have a 3.3 volt for your sensor, the 1.2 volt for your micro and two volts for an audio application. Okay. And we are using a 10 microfarad 0402 capacitor, and it definitely has some level of derating. So that's where I've put in the effective capacitance next to the output voltage range. Now, you see that the output voltage ripple when the loads are 10 milliamp on each of the rail is only 25, in the range of 20, 25 millivolts. That's really good. Yeah. So this performance shows you that in a typical application, your ripples are really less. Now, the next one which I'm showing is a case where you're doing a lot more activity. Say, you know, you're playing more music or your heart is running. You're running, so you're sensing your heart rate at a higher, faster pace. So all of those things demand a higher output current. And so in this case, you see that the inductor current, I have changed the I peak or the I limit to a higher number, which is one amp. And the ripple is in the range of about 50 millivolts in this particular application or use case. We have a lot of collateral available to show you how we can reduce this with very easy steps. So I can definitely point out towards the collateral which we have for this. Excellent. The next one, which is very important when you're evaluating DC to DC regulator is a low transient. So in this case, 
consider a case where you know you got a data packet or you have a, one of the application where you're processing a lot of information. That microcontroller was the 1.2 volt rail. So the bottom curve which you see is from the 10 milliamp to 100 milliamp. That is the load step which the microcontroller will have, which the power IC has to support. Okay. So the key takeaway on this one is that when the load transient happened, you don't see any undershoot or when the load goes away, you don't see an overshoot. What you see on the 1.2 volt rail is the load regulation. Ah, okay. And the other critical thing is that when the transitions are happening on the load, you don't see any spikes on the other rails. Like the 3.3 volt rail is still has the same ripple. The 2.05 has the same ripple. There is no additional crosstalk. So this is highly desirable in an application. Yeah. In the next one, that, that is, I did this on the 3.3 volt rail. So what that shows is that this is the case where you are actually sensing your heart rate. So you have a current pulse, which is happening on the 3.3 volt rail, which is powering that sensor. And you see, again, a very clean performance. You don't see any transients on the 1.2 or the 2.05. And you just see load regulation, which is in the range of, you know, 10 millivolts. So it's really good. Now, you know, we all would definitely want to increase our battery life. And supply current is another area of, you know, concern or a question. Yeah. So this highlights over here is that the current in this PMIC is very scalable. What I mean by that is you can turn on and off the rails individually. And when you are in a state which is a low power state, at that point, you don't have to keep all the regulators on. So if I take the black curve, you see that at around 3.6 volts, the current is only 1.8 microamps. And that is where I would go into a low power state uh, when I'm not doing a lot of activity. Okay. Another critical thing in a system PMIX is that we have four rails in this case. And some systems have a critical power up sequence requirement. And this PMIC supports that. This PMIC, you can actually program the power up sequence for the rails you have at different times. This helps you also to reduce the ripple on your input capacitor because the batteries used in these kind of applications are really small. So this is very helpful in maintaining overall performance. Cool. Okay. Now, efficiency is also super important for any power management story, right? That is correct. So this is where I'm going to spend more time to showcase this part. At top left, you see this traditional power tree. Now, there are multiple ways of implementing a power solution. This one shows a PMIC where you have one buck regulator and three LDOs. And a lot of times when a system designer is designing the system, they can have a bias towards efficiency numbers. So in this case, a buck regulator is showing you an efficiency of 90%. And on the right side, we have the same power tree, but now powered by the SIMO PMIC. In this case, on the SIMO PMIC side, you see that the 2.05 has approximately 82.5% efficiency. But what really matters is the whole system efficiency. Because, you know, you see that on the left side, the 1.2 volt rail, you're just getting 58.5% efficiency because that's powered from the buck. Whereas on the right side, you see that that efficiency is actually 78%. So when I do the full analysis, there is a approximate 9% improvement in efficiency when you use a SIMO PMIC to power your solution, which also means that you have less heat dissipation. Sure. You have less battery current, which means your battery is going to last longer. Yeah. And also because we have a bug boost architecture, we can operate for a longer range for the battery, which means you're using the battery for a broader range as compared to what the left side solution can do. So all of this put together is all win-win. Now, one other critical one, is the size, right? For the same solution, you're seeing that the SIMO PMIC was 27% smaller in solution size. And in some cases where you need to power the 3.3 with maybe another regulator using a traditional, it can be, you know, up to 52% smaller solution size. All right, now let me bring in Carrie Delano, one of the fathers of Audio Class D. Now, you are a renowned name in the world of audio. So let's talk about one of the biggest markets for Simo PMIX, hearables. Great. Thank you, Amelia. So let's talk about an example of a Bluetooth system. So 
In a typical Bluetooth system, you have a Bluetooth RF controller powering an audio codec, which is, includes a headphone amplifiers to drive a left and right speaker and some microphones. That system obviously has to be powered by a PMIC, which is then powered by a battery. And there's additionally, typically, some biosensors to detect locations of the things around the headphones and such things. Sure. Okay, so what if I have a lower quality audio amplifier? How do you manage the coupling into the audio? That's a good question. So in the previous example, we had Maxim codecs and PMIX power in the system, and those had very good power supply rejection. If you don't have as good of a quality of a headphone amplifier, you can still use our PMIC, and it is still a good, very good solution for the system. In that case, you will want to use either an LDO to reduce, increase your power supply rejection, or you'll want to set the iLIM settings to different levels. A very low level will give you a reduced power supply noise. Uh, and you can also increase the output capacitors to reduce the ripple. In any case, you're able to solve it with any headphone amplifier in the market today. Cool. Okay, so Carrie, I heard that the Maxim headphone amplifier has really good noise rejection. But what if you aren't using a Maxim headphone amplifier? What we've done is we've taken a golden case scenario where you've powered the headphone amplifier, DAC, and digital system with discrete LDOs versus our solution where we use the SIMO to power the same systems. And we call those setup one and setup two. When you use setup one versus setup two, what you'll find is the noise floor is very good, obviously, as you would expect with the golden LDO noise source PMIC solution. And when you use our solution, you find it's very similar results, actually. We have a very good noise floor, even when we're powering the headphone amplifier and DAC with our SIMO solution. Cool. Okay. And then next, what we did, we just said, how about a dynamic range test? So we take a minus 60 dB full-scale signal. We use the same PMIC to power the headphone amplifier. And you can see on the left with the LDO, the dynamic range is very good. You do see some 60 hertz and harmonics thereof coupling into the system. And when you use the SIMO to power the headphone amplifier, you see the same harmonics of the 60 hertz. And you do see a little bit at 500 to 600 kilohertz, but it's very small, much, much smaller than even the 60 hertz coupling. And so we have a very good dynamic range measurement when we power our system with our SIMO as well. So, Carrie, this has been quite a bit in the hearable space. Can you recap your main points? Yeah, so the SIMO increases the battery life versus without affecting the audio quality. The in-band noise floor is very good, whether you're using the SIMO or you're using LDOs to power it. It's not affecting the noise floor, and the in-band spectrum tests we did were with a minus 60 dB full-scale signal, which is also known as a dynamic range test, a minus 3 dB full-scale signal, which is a full-scale signal, driving a nominal 32-ohm load. And what you'll find is when you look at the A-weighted output noise and the dynamic range, they're essentially unchanged versus the golden case scenario of driving them, powering them with an LDO. Nice. Okay, Carrie, so what are my big takeaways from today's presentation? So the good news about the SIMO is it's, it's a very highly integrated solution, which means you have a very small form factor, and it's very good for mobile and portable devices. It's very small and lightweight. And it also provides for a very long battery life, especially compared to using separate LDOs or even using one buck converter and multiple LDOs in addition to that. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. All right. Thank you, Amelia. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about Maxim Integrated's SIMO Power Management ICs. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. Can't miss it, right across the top. Or check out YouTube, keyword EE Journal. <laughs>